Welcome to the Totally Shui Podcast with Mary Mears and Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a DC animated universe podcast. I always sound so grouchy when these things you start. Do. I don't mean to. That's just like my default <laughs> state of being. Yeah, this is his happy face. Well, his more content face. So how is everybody doing today? I know you can't answer, but I'll tell you how I'm doing. They can respond in the comments saying Yeah. Respond in the comments. How are you doing? I mean it. So how am I doing today? I am I I work this weekend. We're filming this on the weekend. Filming? We're recording this. Um, on a weekend and I happen to be working this weekend and I have to say haven't had too bad of a day but um yeah I'm just I'm just ready to talk about some some animated stuff now mm. what about you Luke yeah yeah generally okay we've been editing videos for the upcoming week all morning since about what five this morning You've got some really exciting stuff going on. If you would allow me a moment to have a little rant. <laughs> Just a little rant. Just a little. Um, I have been plagued by Zoom problems. Ugh. Zoom is the, the bane of my existence at the moment. I set up all of my calls perfectly. Set it up to record everything locally. Separate audio tracks for each person. Every time it does something wrong that it's not supposed to do. I did a commentary track with Dan Reber a couple of weeks ago and it did not record separate tracks even though that tick box was ticked. Uh, so we're gonna have to do it again. Oh no. Sorry, Dan. Oh, I, mean, I, I say sorry to Dan, he, li he likes doing it, it's fine. But I, I need to be respectful of his time because I do ask a lot of him. Isn't he great though? Yeah, of course he is. I've said this before and I'll say it time and time again if I have to. What great people that are, are are just willing to give you their time and yeah. actually talk about something that is well especially to you and I that is it's quite a big thing in our life and yeah. you know it, it's nice that I think you could call them friends I would like to yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and I I had a call with um Brad Raider and Kevin Altieri for a commentary track for Feet of Clay Part 2 and okay it recorded the separate audio tracks this time the audio was not as clear as it normally is i can get around that that's okay but the most egregious thing is the audio was completely out of sync with the video so like our lips would be moving but then the words would follow afterwards and i would adjust the audio line it up perfectly and yet it would get out of sync again it's just like it was randomly dropping just a couple of split seconds here and there on the recording so I, I've had to get creative um, so for those of you that like watching or listening to the the crew commentary videos surprise Feet of Clay Part 2 is coming up on Halloween that's my my actual Halloween day post uh, it's with Brad Raider and Kevin Altieri talking about Feet of Clay Part 2 and a little bit about what they would have done if they were the ones working on Part 1 Lots of neat insight into the making of that fan favorite episode. And it actually could have been really different if uh, Kevin and Brad hadn't worked on it. And I've got some other stuff coming up, you know, like usual weekly video uh, storyboards. I'm doing a storyboard video for Act 3 of On Leather Wings because that's the only part of On Leather Wings I've got so far. And, you know, sticking with the horror theme of the week. Yep. We're going to do that act where we see the transformation from Kirk Langstrom into the Man Bat and the, the flight over Gotham City. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to sharing that. The Friday video is going to be the um, something I polled people about whether I should do it or not. And it's a video about Batman The Adventures Continue. Now I know that my non-character spotlight videos are less popular than you know the videos about a specific villain or Harvey Bullock. For some reason, that Harvey Bullock video just brings in thousands of views a day, and I don't understand because why. Because it's one of the best characters in the entire series. Yeah, I mean, I like Harvey Bullock, don't get me wrong. It's really, he's a really interesting character, and um, Bobby Costanza, who plays him, is, is excellent. Absolutely. But people are really passionate about him, and I, I didn't know that that would happen. So got that to look forward to even gilgamesh in the background was getting passionate just now i don't know <laughs> if you heard his little squeak but no. he was like Meow. they might have heard him wasn't yeah. he just yawning no they're birdies outside oh okay yeah. all right fair enough 
have I um, explained to them that I sometimes hear your conversations, but I'm usually trying to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, So one day I will stay up past (laughs) time (laughs) and actually listen. (laughs) But like I said, isn't it fun calling them friends? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And I, I, (laughs) I actually feel quite passionately that people like Dan Reber and Kevin Altieri and Brad Raider, particularly Brad Raider, don't get enough appreciation for their contributions. They really don't. Like everybody, and this isn't a dig at Bruce Tim, by the way, because Bruce Tim is obviously a very talented person. Yeah, and, a very great artist. And the shows probably wouldn't exist without him. Yeah, word. But it's not just him. No. It's definitely not just Mm-mm. him. And there is that <clears throat> kind of perception out there that Bruce Tim did all the work. And, you know, he did a lot of work. He, he approved most of the work true. But a lot of the stuff that people really love about these shows, the the stuff that they think is exceptional, the stuff they think stands out, came from these individuals and their specific contributions. And I like highlighting that. Yeah, and I I'm one of those people that believe a TV show is a it, it's it's a collaborative mm-hmm. effort, but sometimes the individual that puts out maybe some of the better ideas deserves the credit and mm-hmm. deserves the the limelight because that's what you do and sometimes in a collaborative slash team effort there are people that need to be honored for the work that they've done for that particular project whether mm-hmm. it's a tv show or or a sports team and yep. the people that you're speaking to have have always deserved that 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 special I, I don't know how to explain it but that I guess they, they they've always deserved the limelight but I just feel like they they haven't had enough of it yeah. and it and it's very sad because this this TV show one one you know the uh, Batman the animated series premiered in 1992 that is like that is 31 years ago. Excuse me while I turn to dust. <laughs> and a lot of these people have, they don't, you know, they've barely got like write-ups for it. And, yeah. and, and, you know, you know, thankfully we live in the age of the internet and we can actually say, Hey, these guys and gals did really great work. Let's honor them by talking about them and showing the new generation who these gals and guys are. Yeah. And I think you're you're doing a great, great work doing that. Thank you. It's very nice of you to and, say. And I know sometimes it might not feel like it for you, but I do think you're making a big difference, especially with with fans like my like like me that would not have as much information if it were if it wasn't for you mm. and i wouldn't know half of the people that that you have talked about without well without being married to you <laughs> well not just being married to you but obviously we're friends and everything but you know without you talking about it you know not just because of the youtube stuff but it's just because of great interest in our lives yeah um and it, it makes such a big difference from a, a person that's also a movie buff to know behind the, the behind the scenes stuff yeah yeah and one of the things i've done with this commentary video is because the the on camera so to speak footage of us just doesn't line up with the audio no matter what i do <laughs> i've just decided I've, i'm gonna play the storyboards over the top oh so, that's lovely so you can actually see what they're referring to when they talk oh, about oh yeah. when brad came up with this um yeah. this design or you know this this piece of character movement or whatever and just to this is going to sound like bashing Bruce Tim, and I'm really sorry. It's not what I mean, but I've seen him in interviews say, "Oh, I have no idea how we got such great animation for Feet of Clay Part Two. How did TMS come up with the ideas for those transformations?" I'm like, "Well, listen here. Look at the storyboards. Mike <laughs> yeah. Gogan drew all those characters. Okay, yeah, TMS came up with the transitions, many of the transitions, I should say, but Mike Gogan drew all of those. He came up with them." And it's not by chance, you know, Kevin Altieri hired him and assigned the role to him. It's not luck. It's not 
chance. It's not witchcraft. It was very specifically planned out. And, you know, I hope more people realise that after uh, watching the uh, the commentary tracks and listening to them. No, here's the thing about, um, about Bruce Tim. He is not actually saying that he has, no. has done every single thing. I no. want to put that out yeah, there right now because he's not, not doing that. And I think no. a lot of the stuff that Bruce Tim has done has been brilliant. Mm-hmm. But there are other people who have done brilliant things yeah. too. Yeah, and just to clarify, not bashing Bruce Tim. Oh God, no! I think he's great. Yeah, I've got of some, course. I've got some of his Comic Con sketchbooks, which ra- I randomly found in Gosh Comics in London in a box. Just that like, was a good find, wasn't yeah. it? Just on a random. I yeah. think we had just came back from Franco Manca. I Something think that's like how that. you say that that yeah. restaurant. And then we were like, "Oh, let's go here." And did you find one of them? Yeah, I found and one then, of them there. Yeah, um, and I, I was just in there. And I asked, you know, oh, can I have a look in this box of Batman comics? They were like, oh, yeah, sure. It's, it's apparently it's their more valuable stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was just flipping through it. And because Bruce Tim begins with B, he was in with the Batman stuff. But, yeah, so I got his his sketchbooks, uh, his self-published sketchbooks. They're just black and white things that he would sell at Comic-Con. I think <clears> his, <throat> his, his, his life story is quite, quite good as well. Yeah. I mean, honestly, all mm. of the people that we, we, we look up to because of this show... I think all of their life stories, you can kind of see a little bit of it, if not a lot of it, in mm-hmm. in this show. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, definitely not bashing Bruce Bruce Tim, because I think again a collaborative effort, and without yeah. him, I don't think just like without Kevin and without Dan and without so many other Shirley. Or, mm. you know, the other Kevin. Yeah. Andrea Romano yeah. as well. Yeah. Without all of them, this show would not be what it is. Mm. And it, what it is, is a beautiful piece of art. Yes, it is. We happen to have all over this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I always get a little embarrassed when I go on these calls with them. And it's it's like you can see in the background, I've got a, a lenticular bottleneck gallery print of the Batman animated series logo on my door. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I should cover that up. I look like a weirdo. It's like I don't know if you've ever watched Alan Partridge, but he ends up going. He, he's having this important meeting, at, but at the time he's living in a hotel and he doesn't mm-hmm. want to look because he's broken up with his wife. Yeah, he doesn't want to look like a loser. I, I, know, I know which episode you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, so he he's there's this guy that meets him. He's like a super fan, and he says, oh, you can come around my house and pretend it's your house. He goes, oh, great, fantastic. So he takes these important TV executives into this guy's house, not knowing that it's full of like Alan Partridge memorabilia and like just plastered all over the walls. And he's just like, oh my God, I'm in a crazy person's house. <laughs> really very funny. Yeah, That's a great, that's a, that's a, that's a great show. Yeah. But that's a little bit like what my office is like. Cause I've, I've got all these prints and boxes full of comics and statues and oh good god okay so even in our our bedroom we have um some george calcutas mm-hmm. artwork um that i love we used to have quite a bit more in, in that room but i wanted to kind of tone it down a little bit um so i think we have six yeah i think there's six there's in there. six and you know what's great about those particular prints is you can mix and match, and you mm-hmm. can um, you can swap and change them anytime you want. Yeah. But can we get to the topic of this episode yet? Well, there is one other thing I wanted to talk about just quickly before okay. we get to the Go topic. On, then. It's not good news. It was announced this morning that Richard Moll, the voice of Two Face, oh. passed away. Yeah. Uh, on, I believe it was on Thursday evening. Um, whatever the date was on Thursday, like the 26th, 26th, I believe. Yeah, 26th yeah. of October. Um, now, during the pandemic, when we were all on lockdown, um, I bought some signed items from Richard through Galaxycom. And he was supposed to attend like a virtual panel because, as you know, during the pandemic, everything was virtual. So people would dial, uh, dial in from their homes. Mm-hmm. But he cancelled at the last minute because he'd been in ill health. And um, when I'd requested the items, I'd actually asked him to write, you know, from the wrong Harvey, Richard Mole. 
Oh, yeah, that's right behind me, isn't yeah. it? However, I got the response saying that he was too unwell to take on detailed uh, requests like that. Oh. So what he provided me was just to Luke, Richard Moll, Two-Face. Yeah. And that's perfect. It's wonderful. Beautiful. I'm going to treasure it forever. Yeah. And I also got a, a cell from uh, Second Chance that he'd signed in the top left corner. Mm-hmm. And again... Perfect, precious treasure. It was made all the more precious by the fact that um, Kevin Conroy has a cell, or had, excuse me, a cell from the same sequence. So it's when Two-Face is getting frustrated with his coin landing on its side, so he's flipping Mm -hmm. it. I've got it just before it flips, and Kevin Conroy had it as it was flipping, Um, which I thought was wonderful. but anyway, the point I was making is that, you know, this was, what, two and a half, three years ago, something yeah. like that. And he was quite unwell even then that he had to cancel appearances. And the the signing itself actually took, I want to say it took about eight months for the items to be delivered. And that's quite a long time. Um, and it's not just because of the pandemic. It's because he was too unwell yeah. for a period to even simply sign his name. Yeah. Um, so in a way, I'm glad that he passed peacefully. And he's no longer suffering. Um, and he's he's left behind a tremendous body of work that will live on forever. Absolutely I mean, not beautiful. just in Batman, but, you know, he was in Night Court. People know him most for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, he will always be Harvey Dent. And he is the definitive Two-Face. That was, it, it's, Absolutely. It's so fortunate that that was the very first uh, version of Two-Face to be seen outside of the comics. And certainly the first animated or televisual version of the character before Tommy Lee Jones, before Aaron mm-hmm. Eckhart and better than all of them. I, I believe so, yeah. yeah. And you know how much I love Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. I like Aaron Eckhart as well, but Tommy Lee Jones is like is one of my favorite actors that that's still alive. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, it's it's such a shame, but again, like you said, just to to to, to mirror your statement very ill for a, quite a while and it's 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 nice to not have him in pain and all of that but yeah he will always be the two-face yeah and i actually got very depressed reading some of the comments on my community post about it mm-hmm. um and it wasn't like someone being malicious or anything but they were listing out everyone that had passed away yeah and my response to it was like jesus christ it's easier to just list who's still left than everyone yeah. that's passed away. That that happens when you unfortunately it's one of those things that that starts to happen to you when you get older. And Luke <laughs> and I are um, ancient. <laughs> no, we're not ancient. No, I'm not. I'm thirty five. Um and and Luke is older than me. Not much. No, not much older. Only like two years. Yeah. And you know, it's our favorite actor, Marlon Brando, died in 2004. And then I think it's just been like an avalanche <laughs> ever since then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it technically started for me. It started with Frank Sinatra, I believe, in 98. Is that when he passed? I don't know. Yeah, it, it's something like that. And then, you know, a couple other people. And then Marlon. And that was like, oh, my God. And then more recently, Kevin. Mm-hmm. And... It, it's heartbreaking, but the stuff that they leave behind in the, the television and movie space is, it's beautiful. And I think his um, his take on Two-Face will forever, it is probably forever imprinted in, in my mind as when I think of, of some of the gnarliest villains you've ever seen on 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 tv or movies i think i think i have to put two-face up there and and if you watch the show you might not think he's too bad but with that voice acting oh my god (laughs) just it's it's on another level yeah (sighs) and now we're gonna try to move on from this 
and talk about some some spooky stuff some yeah halloween type stuff yeah this is supposed to be our halloween episode and <laughs> we've just kind of meandered for the first sort of 20 minutes talking about anything but but yeah. uh, what do you expect that's what yeah. we always do I mean, there's hello. no script yeah well no no there's no script i've not read anything part down. of a script that we have is if you have like news or something or if there's a particular like um scene or something we want to talk about but mm-hmm. other than that yeah there's no script mm-hmm. so i've i've spoken a lot for like the first 15 or so minutes of this <laughs> so why don't you take us away with the topic mary all right so today we're gonna talk about like halloweeny stuff stuff that's like ghoulish stuff that's spooky stuff that i honestly think should be you know characterized in the in the the horror um, slash Halloween genre because mm-hmm. a lot of people think of Halloween as just horror, but it's not. You know the the thing, especially well, I think especially in the states, we do trick or treating, and it's trick or treat. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why it's trick or treat is because do you want a trick, or do you want a piece of candy? Well, hopefully it's a piece of candy. I used to get toothbrushes, <laughs> <laughs> and I got earplugs once. I wonder if my brother is listening to this. Which he probably isn't. But I wonder if he remembers in the city that we were from, if he remembers the man that lived by the police station that gave us the earplugs. I, I bet you he will. What a treat. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I want to talk about some stuff that I've actually been watching recently. Mm-hmm. And um, we have been rewatching uh, Batman Beyond. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm gonna say this about, um, my watching, uh, history is a lot of the time I rewatch things, um, like Grey's Anatomy and, and, you know, Batman Beyond and Justice League because it's, I'm at a place in my life where I just need to, to watch something that makes me happy or something that puts me in not a, a doom and gloom mood. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we watch Batman Beyond. <laughs> and I always forget how gloomy that, that show actually was. Because you, you think, I know, because with Batman, that was always doom and gloom. Like, always. That was kind of like, occasionally you got the, you know, not so gloomy. And then you had Justice League. Or no, sorry. And then you had uh, Batman Beyond. But the other shows like um like static shock and uh is it the zeta project yeah superman superman not as gloomy (laughs) no no not at all (laughs) so yeah um circling it back to talking about batman beyond one of the the episodes that i've i've mentioned a few times on this podcast but haven't actually spoke about why i like it and why I don't like it at the same time, which I think is one of the best things about, um, like a, a piece of a piece of art is I think you always have to like something about it. But there's also the, you can dislike something about that art that you like, and I think that can make it very special. Splicers. <laughs> okay. So I, in a way, for the Halloween bit, you have the. It's not a costume. It's kind of like a permanent costume, in a sense. Um, you have that, but it's also that you are getting that horror aspect because you're you're gene splicing. Mm-hmm. You are completely changing something, and that could. And I'm going to probably say this phrase a lot. That would make a really great movie. <laughs> like it would. It would definitely. Oh, it, it's it's just one of those things that it's so different. Um, well, it was different at the time. I do believe that um, some people might have been inspired by um, the work of the DC animated universe, in my humble opinion. Yeah, what do you think about that one? Um, I think it's very interesting that the splicers are very clearly a development from Kirk Langstrom's Man Bat. Mm. He was like the prototype splicer. He was the person that was adjusting his own DNA to become 
just he just wanted to be a bat. Yeah. He just wanted to be a man bat, God, fly around, bat. screech at people. He didn't have like ambitions for taking over the world. Yeah. He just didn't want to be human anymore. He is essentially, uh, he's basically an addict, a drug addict. Yeah. And he wants to fade away into oblivion and just fly around happy as a monster. That's all he wanted yeah. to do. And the Splicers have similar uh, views. They're all unhappy with their own bodies. Yeah, exactly. And, and they want to change something about them, whether that's give themselves, you know, panther eyes or mm -hmm. or turn themselves into like a big tough bull. Or snake. Or yeah, or the snake guy, yeah. Um, the cobra. I mean, Cobra did use splices yeah. as well. Yes, you're right. That's true. But there was actually a snake guy in the splices yeah. episode who yeah. was with the uh, the Panther lady. Name. No, I don't remember any of their names, unfortunately. Yeah. Apart from Dr. Cuvier. I remember Dr. Cuvier, yeah. who turns himself into Chimera when Chimera. he uh, injects himself with all the different genes mm -hmm. and he becomes like this eagle-faced snake mammal thing. And then uh, Terry injects him with even more of them and he just becomes this big pulsating blob. Yeah. So sorry if this sounds like a weird jump cut because we in the editing process found that the audio file was partially corrupted so we're going to have to record this part of the podcast again. Joy. Yeah. <laughs> Mary's ecstatic about this because we we spoke quite in depth about a number of horrifying episodes. I talked about Starro. Yes, so in the call Batman Beyond. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I talked about how I felt that that's a good episode to talk about because it it just left an impression on me about I'm I'm one of those people that don't I don't do drugs I don't drink alcohol my choice not because of anything in particular it's just I don't like to be. Um, I, I like to be in control of my own um, my own thoughts, my own my own mind, and everything like that. And this episode really, oh, it it, it gives me it scares the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way to say it, but it does. It's 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 terrifying because I, like I said, I'm the type of person that likes to be in 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 good sound um, mind and body and. This this episode really it just is like ugh. <laughs> it's the idea that there can be something attached to you. Yeah. Influencing you, controlling you, making you act in a way that you normally wouldn't act. Yeah. And it doesn't help that it's a slimy starfish thing from outer space. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's awful. And in the episode itself, the the real horror of it is that it has corrupted Superman. Yeah, the, and, everybody's hero. Yeah, but the thing I always found weird with that episode, and I don't recall them ever explaining the logic behind this, is that Starro is the one that calls Batman in to investigate the the incidents. I I think the reason they did that is because that he knew that, or they knew that. Batman was always going to come and investigate. And they really, really wanted to get Batman's mind. I suppose so. But then the the whole scheme at the end where Starro is asexually reproduced and made thousands of these other little Starros could have just got Batman at that point, surely. Unless Batman was needed for some other reason that I'm just forgetting. Maybe they were just bored. Maybe, maybe. You never know. Maybe they just wanted to collect a full set of Justice League characters even though terry mcginnis batman wasn't a member at that time starro doesn't know that yeah star is a uh, i need to then <laughs> starro is a starfish all right <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean that's that's a, a a good call as well the call is a good call yes well done <laughs> what else did we talk about well i talked about um dreams in darkness mm -hmm. now I put out my Halloween video talking about fear as a topic and how fear drives the narrative in what I think is the scariest episode. That's Feet of Clay Part 1. But Feet of Clay Part 1 is is just a deeply disturbing and horrible episode. I don't mean horrible as in poor quality, although some of the animation's a bit wonky. I mean it's just mean-spirited and unpleasant. And... 
some people have chimed in and said, well, you should have talked about the Scarecrow because Scarecrow is the master of fear. But why? Well, because Scarecrow is the master of fear, it's a closer association with Halloween in their minds. And yeah, that's okay. That's good. The The reason why I didn't is in the majority of Scarecrow episodes, they just see people experiencing their fears and they are hallucinations. Mm -hmm. So there's no real urgency to the situation. It's just they're imagining something and it will pass with time. True. So when I watch those episodes, I don't find it particularly disturbing. Mm. Dreams in Darkness does come close because we they dwell for a long time on Batman's uh, hallucinations. And some of them are quite grotesque and, and some feature some powerful imagery, like where the sewer tunnel, or excuse me, the underpass tunnel that his parents walk into turns into the barrel of a gun and starts dripping red water, which you can interpret as blood before the gun goes off and showers Batman in light. That's it's creative. It's very well made. But I don't think it's particularly frightening. Similarly, his hallucination of the villains where the rat turns into the Joker, which then turns into the Penguin, and Penguin's head bursts and out pops Two-Face. It's grotesque, yes, but I don't think it's frightening. But I think Dreams in Darkness is probably the best Scarecrow episode. The thing with the Scarecrow is he's not much of a, a physical threat. He's not really much of a psychological threat either. He just wants to, to, <laughs> to, to basically torture people so that he can, ex as, as an experiment. Kind of reminds me of what I was mentioning in, the, I think it was in the last episode with um, Sauron, the X-Men character, where Spider-Man confronts him saying, you know, with your scientific genius, you could cure cancer. And Sauron says, I don't want to cure cancer. I want to turn people into dinosaurs. <sighs> Are you, oh, you're talking about Lord of the Rings. Oh, yes, yeah. Saruman says, Saruman. I don't want to cure cancer. I want to make, what are they called? Black orcs or whatever they were called. Dark orcs. Did we, I know we, we probably made that joke before, but did we actually say that I'm a, a, fa a big fan of Lord of the Rings? I think we did. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings. I like Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got a nice little display in our hallway, haven't we? Of some yeah. prints and uh, hardcover books. Very nice, very pleasant. Nice thing to walk into. Yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, I kind of, I don't think I made a very good point about dreams in darkness. I apologise, and I'm sure um, others will have different opinions, and they can chime in in the comments. And you're welcome to have at it. That's fine. We've talked a lot about Batman Beyond, and I always found it kind of ironic that Batman Beyond is intended to be a kids' show or a more child-friendly show. And it had just some of the most disturbing stuff in it. Like we talked in the last episode about Earth Mover. And to me, that is the most frightening episode of Batman Beyond because it's got it's got body horror, it has suspense, it has mystery. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's it's just so again, it's it is grotesque as well. Um, the idea of being buried alive and kind of becoming part of the earth. Mm -hmm. rotting away not being able to move even when the earth mover speaks it's kind of through it's terrifying it's through gritted teeth because mm -hmm. he can't move any part of his body he's, he's barely got any body left but he's kind of talking through his teeth what season is that uh, i think it's season two hmm. i think it might have been season one actually but i think it's season two i don't know if it's okay to talk about this but i've not been in the highest of spirits recently mm -hmm. um but it's it's one of those things where you're or where i'm going through a very weird mental health thing and you know what re-watching things like like batman and batman beyond and justice league and gray's anatomy <laughs> um it really even the walking dead um really makes me feel better but it, it watching batman beyond recently has has proven to kind of not help <laughs> <laughs> i mean i love it don't get me wrong i absolutely love it but it hasn't helped with with my overall um mood i suppose yeah, it hasn't helped with my overall mood. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should stop watching it before going to bed. Oh, then. absolutely not. <laughs> no. And I, sorry to cut you off there, Mary. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add on no. that? No. Okay. So I just I was like, we're not 
stopping watching it before bed. So actually, I'm I can't believe we forgot to mention this earlier, but there is at least one instance of Halloween in the DC animated universe that we didn't talk about. Almost got him. Poison Ivy scheme where she poisoned all the pumpkins. Mm. And uh, it's only a short segment, but there's like... She's walking around in her bathing suit for some reason, barefoot in this pumpkin... What do you call it? Pumpkin patch? Pumpkin yeah, grove? pumpkin patch. In a pumpkin patch. And um, she throws like a poison jack-o'-lantern at Batman with a gas in it. And uh, Batman chases after her in the Batmobile, nearly runs her over, and she climbs up a pole. Uh, the only thing that makes it particularly Halloween-y is the fact that it is set during Halloween and there are pumpkins there. Mm-hmm. I don't know what she was trying to gain from poisoning the pumpkins. Yeah, because she's poisoning her babies. Maybe it's a defence to prevent them from being picked. She doesn't want people yeah. picking all the pumpkins. Yeah. So they pick one, gas yeah. comes out. Yeah. If they're left in the earth alone, then they're fine. Yeah. Booby trapping them then rather than poisoning. Yeah. Doesn't explain why she's wearing her bathing suit though. Maybe she was sun tanning. But it was the evening. Moon tanning. I mean, us witches, <laughs> we do love the moon and we do love to get the benefits of it. And maybe she wanted to get the benefits of it was it a one piece yes well well that kind of she could have just worn her, her her normal outfit she doesn't have bare legs in her normal outfit maybe she wanted to get some light on her legs yeah maybe we'll never know yeah it's just it's just one of those things they just felt like drawing her differently so i think the best character that would revolve around a Halloween episode would be the Joker. It's an interesting take. Can you explain more on that? Well, I think we mentioned earlier that Halloween is going around and asking for tricks or treats. And who is the trickster, <laughs> the ultimate trickster of the DCAU universe? You know what I'm going to say? No. The trickster. Oh. Who is also voiced by Mark Hamill. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, well, it you... makes perfect sense. Yeah, he was the trickster in the Flash TV show before he mm-hmm. was the Joker anyway. But anyway, sorry, carry on. But yeah, I think mentioning or, or not mentioning the Joker would be... Uh, a disservice to Halloween. Although there are no treats. <laughs> no, no. You just got me thinking about Joker's favor as well, where he targets poor Charlie Collins, yeah. and you know Charlie's rude to him on the on the freeway, yeah. and um, without realizing it's the Joker. And once he does, he tries to get away quite sensibly. Mm-hmm. But the Joker tracks him down, and is it's implied he's going to murder Charlie, but Charlie begs for forgiveness and says he'll do anything. So the Joker says, all right, I'll let you off. Mm -hmm. As long as you do me a favor one day. And the favor is to come and open a door for him while he's um, being pushed around inside of a cake by Harley Quinn. Um, And the Joker says, you know, once you complete the favor, you can go. Mm -hmm. But of course the Joker traps him there and says, you know, I never said that you would leave alive. So, I yeah. think you're right. That's what you mean by trickster, is that he he's not necessarily a liar, mm-hmm. but he omits certain key facts from what he says. Yeah, but you never get a treat from it. No. Ever. No. Um, there's, I don't think, when well, when I think of the Joker, I can never think of a good thing that he has done no no never Joker's one of those few villains in Batman the Animated Series that's completely irredeemable um, mm-hmm. he's kind of funny sometimes but he's also he can switch just like that he's mm-hmm. you know he's kind of charming and funny if you think about in Mask of the Phantasm in the the office with Arthur Reeves where he's like talking to him about who he thinks the Phantasm might be he thinks Reeves might be the Phantasm till he hears Andrea Beaumont on the phone and then he just switches completely. He's been like joking around with Reeves, mm-hmm. thinking he might be yeah. the Phantasm. But really, no, he's realized he's not. So now he's just going to murder him. Now, of course, he doesn't actually kill him. He poisons him. But there's that just really 
harrowing shot of the Joker staring blank-eyed straight ahead and laughing as he stabs Reeves with whatever it is he's stabbing him with, maybe some sort of syringe or something, I don't know. They don't actually show it because it's hidden in shadow. But that's a really powerful and frightening scene. Yeah, but the, the Joker's awful. It's like... It, it's disgustingly awful. But yeah, okay, so that seems like a good place to stop off yeah. our uh, Halloween conversation. I'm sure we've missed out plenty of stuff. Some some of it will get brought up in the comments because I have looked at the comments before we talk about them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if there's anything that's still left off, feel free to share them in the comments and we'll read them out next time. So, would you like to get to some questions and comments yeah let's load up the comments and the questions from the last episode okay so we've got the comments loaded up and we have some questions here so okay. from jag 2045 hey jag i think this is a new commenter i don't recall the name jag 2045 I just want to say hey jag. yeah i apologize if you've commented before um i am a forgetful old man as we've established so Jag 2045 says, really loving the channel. Thank you very much. That's kind of you to say. On the subject of expensive BTAS purchases, have you ever bought any of the high-end stuff like the Mondo 1-6 scale figures or the animated series <laughs> statues? <laughs> she says, looking over to the right. Has he? How many? So I've got all of the Mondo figures, which is what, one, two, three, four, five, six of them so far. I've pre-ordered Man Bat and the Phantasm, so that'll be eight. Mm -hmm. Um, the, to be honest, the statues I haven't ventured into too much. I've got the black and white Batgirl. Mary's got the black and white Harley Quinn. And we've got the Harley's... Oh, um, Harley's Holiday? Yeah, Harley's Holiday statue um, from DC Collectibles. Let's, let's be honest, that's mainly for Bud and Lou. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's beautifully done. It is a beautiful statue. So much so that I, I, I had it out for just a few minutes and I had to quickly put it back because I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think it's been out since the day we got it. It was out on display for a little while, but we dusted it? it off and we, yeah, it was like a couple of weeks maybe. Do you remember we used to have a display cabinet and it was used to be in there? The amount of times I've changed this room around. Yes. Is, is, it, ugh. but yeah, he's <laughs> got, um, well, I should say we, because some of them are mine too, but we, we do love those. So, yeah, we do have some of the high-end ones. Yeah. Not to brag. Yeah, it's not a brag thing. I've got... <laughs> don't look at my bank balance. Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I hope that answered your His question. His wife just looked at him. <laughs> yeah, I know. <clears throat> so, moving on to the next question. Uh, Basement of Mars 1963. That's another new commenter. Yeah, hey. So, whenever I think back to the many horrifying or disturbing moments in the DCAU, the one that sticks out to me is Rudy Jones' transformation in the Paras uh, into the Parasite in Superman the Animated Series. Even whilst watching that scene as an adult, it's still scary as F, and it was in a Superman cartoon of all things, which you generally expect to be light-hearted and on the softer side when compared to Batman, but not even BTS managed to reach that level of disturbing body horror, or at least it wasn't f shown fully on screen. Now that's a Clayface reference right there, because yes, you saw the silhouette. Um, and I, I actually think that makes it more frightening, because yeah. your mind's eye fills I, in the I rest agree. of it. But the Parasite stuff, uh, it's interesting you bring this up because uh, who wrote that episode? Was it Rich Fogel, I think it was? Um, I'm not sure now. I think it was Rich Fogel. Might not have been. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But I remember listening to an interview with them talking about writing this episode. And they actually originally wrote a similar um, revenge story to like Feet of Clay, but with Parasite. And um, he said that Bruce Tim took one look at it and said that's not the kind of show we're making with superman it's not going to be like batman it's got to be lighter so they went with okay it's got that transformation where you can see like rudy jones pop out of the pink sludge and he's like it's, it's, it looks like his skin's being burnt off but after he transforms and realizes that he's finally in this position of power he actually likes being the parasite that's one of the scariest things about it is that he's he's in it's not I don't know if I would say enjoying it, but he likes he yeah, likes he, being the parasite. He does enjoy it. He enjoys having the power because he goes after that guy that's uh, voiced by Robert Patrick. I've mm -hmm. forgotten his name. And he he just torments him the same way yeah. that he had been bullying Rudy at the start of the episode. 
Mm-hmm. So and Rudy was just taking it because you know he's you know he's he's just a janitor. Um, and he's finally got a taste of power, and he, I mean, he is abusing it. So continuing the comment, so oh yeah, a small correction, but I don't think Invader Zim was cancelled because of the organ harvesting episode or because Gur was covered in blood for a split second. I think the reason was a bit more mundane. The show was too expensive for Nick and they didn't want to cough up the money for more episodes. How, Lame. How dare you? How dare you give honesty, truth, justice? How dare you? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm to, to be honest, I've just, I haven't looked to it too deep into it that's just something i read on the internet when it happened honestly so yeah i i figured as much honestly because a, a lot of those those nick shows you you had some that just did two seasons and that was it and some of those are some of the best things ever um i don't know if you guys ever watched liquid generation on um mtv there were a few shows like that that did maybe maybe a stint of 10 episodes or something and then it just stopped because you know not as many people were watching them and this this and that but i'll tell you something out of all of those shows and this includes in invaders them who put out merch it's the shows that those execs were like nah nobody's gonna watch this like excuse me have I been looking at Loungefly to see if they do an Invader Zim bag? Yeah. Yeah, I have. I think they have, but I just uh, wasn't aware of it at the time. And that's my thoughts. <laughs> You're probably going to keep that. No, I'm not at all. Um, so Captain Alce is, uh, in talking in this little thread hey. here. Says, I've been re-watching Superman recently, and some of the horror elements are genuinely shocking even mm. now. Anything involving Parasite is disturbing AF. The real world analogy to his crimes is horrific to think about. And the voice direction of literally any character being electrocuted is stunning. I like the pun there. Yeah. (laughs) Stunning. But I distinctly remember the dark side moment Luke brought up, killing Dan Turpin, being the first thing on TV that genuinely messed with me as a kid. I'm sorry to hear that. My mum worried she let me watch BTAS too young because of how dark and mature it was. But it never quite made me cry the way Darkseid's petty cruelty did. Can, can we can we talk about something really quick? Yes. Talking about things that uh, scared us as kids, I can I can remember one of the the first things that that ever really scared me that I was um, that I was watching on TV was the news. Hmm. No, because they had in in Oklahoma there had been this shooting. And it was on the street that was behind where my mother lived, where me, my brother, and my my mother lived. And it was scary because the reporters were live reporting it. I must have been maybe four years old. They were live reporting it. And if we went out into the backyard, we would have been able to see it. Mm-hmm. So that, that scared the, the shit out of me. And um, I'll always remember that. So tell your mom it's not the worst thing in the world you could have watched. <laughs> and just to close the loop on that thread there, so um, Basement of Mars 1963 responded to Captain Alsa's saying, yes, Dan Turpin's death ranks up there for shocking DCAU moments or just animated TV in general. I recall seeing the episode when it premiered, and when that happened, I remember my brother saying something to the effect of, oh my God, they killed Dan Turpin. It's really rare that you see someone murdered on a children's show without any censorship and even more so just having them be permanently dead with zero chance they'll be brought back. Harsh, but looking at it now, I can appreciate that. It's an important lesson for the younglings out there and that lesson is if an evil alien space lord blasts you with his laser eyes, you will indeed die and there'll be no restarts. And stay tuned for Pokemon. Did they actually say that? Yeah. I love you. (laughs) Well, I mean, love is a big word, but I like you. Yeah, it's very funny. Uh, so David Carney returns and says when it comes to purchases I recently got a BTAS Harley Quinn pop every time I read a comic book I hear Kevin Conroy Mark Hamill Arlene Sorkin Mark Hamill's Joker voice still gets me years later question who are your top three Batman and Joker voices in animation for me it's Kevin Conroy Bruce Greenwood and Jensen Ackles for the Joker Mark Hamill Troy Baker 
and Kevin Michael Richardson. Great podcast as always. Have a great week, both of you. I'm so glad you mentioned Troy Baker. I know, because I was going to say Troy Baker myself, because the only two that I, I can say that I can remember are Mark Hamill and Troy Baker. Mm-hmm. Because Troy Baker did a brilliant job. Yeah. He was very clearly influenced by Mark Hamill, which is, you know, probably why we like it so much. Yeah. I've met Troy Baker. Yeah, a couple of times. The last time we saw him, you didn't you didn't even go over and talk to him. No, because it was like he was in London and he was just doing something with his family and I didn't want to I didn't want to bug. Yeah, but we don't see him very often. So we saw him years ago. Uh, As like if a, we're friends. <laughs> well, we saw him years ago at yeah. a uh, a launch party for a, for a video game. And he was, you know, he was very polite to me and he was, you know, he signed my Batman Arkham Origins book which probably a little embarrassing because you know i'm just like hello troy nice to meet you can you sign this book for me please <laughs> <laughs> oh my god when i met him yeah when you met him he was you <laughs> started talking about college football for ages i know and um you know he's he's open about where he's from and everything and i'm i'm open about being from oklahoma and all of that and as i'm talking about oklahoma my accent comes out <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so lovely to um because I don't know, well, at the time, I didn't know a lot of people at, at, at these gaming events. And to actually speak to somebody that I, 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 I like his voice and, 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 you know, something that I've played. And to be like, yo, you sound like me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're, you know, let's do this. And we literally, we just spoke about college football. And, you know, sometimes meeting um, someone you, you kind of look up to um great yeah and we saw him over the summer um at a restaurant as he was leaving I, I got up and went to just say hello to him and he looked at me and he was like yeah i remember that event but i can't remember you and i was like yeah break my heart troy break my heart it's okay but he was really nice and friendly and he was like oh yeah yeah you remember this you remember that da, 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 from the things at the event yeah. so he's such a lovely gentleman because a lot of a lot of times you'll meet actors or 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 whatnot or mu- musicians and they're just really terrible people and very rude. I can honestly say he is just so genuine and nice, and I it was so it was such a relief, <laughs> even at that particular launch party, just to um, also talk about something from like where we're from. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he's, he's amazing. So yeah. Yeah, so we haven't actually answered the question. No. So, so <laughs> true to life. Yeah. Um, so for me, best Batman? Kevin. Obviously Kevin, number one. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go Diedrich Bader next from Batman Brave and the Bold and the Harley Quinn show. Uh, I think he's very good. Um, and I'll go Jensen Eccles as well. Is that how you say his name? I've completely forgotten. But you know who I'm talking about. And then for the Joker, obviously Mark Hamill and Troy Baker, he can go second. And I also like Kevin Michael Richardson's Joker. I didn't really care for the Batman that much, but I liked um, his casting as the Joker. Yeah. Would you like to hear mine? Sure. So who are they? Batman? Mm-hmm. Kevin? That's it. <laughs> Joker? Mark Hamill? Mm-hmm. Troy Baker? Mm-hmm. Done. Okay. Who else? Or was that it? That was it. Those okay. are the two. I thought we were going to talk about, like, you know, Flash. and. <laughs> well, there's two that are really good Flashes, right? Mm-hmm. There's Michael Rosenbaum and there's Clancy Brown. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> That's it. No one else. And, and if we're talking about Superman, <laughs> it's Tim Daly. George Newburn as well. Well, George Newburn, obviously. And That's it. That's it. Okay, so the next comment is from Bookworm, who has returned after an absence. Hello, Bookworm. How are you doing? Hi. For scary Justice League episodes, I suggest only a dream. Dr. Destiny is essentially Freddy Krueger for a 10-year-old. I agree. Yes. Yeah. I agree. I, I, that's just the perfect way to to describe to describe the Doctor. Yes, and I really like that Batman defeated Dr. Destiny by humming Frere Jocker. Is that copyrighted? Sorry? Is that copyrighted? I don't know. I don't think so. No, it's an old okay. old tune. Um, and drinking lots of coffee. Drink, drank a lot of coffee and hummed a, a French tune and then punched Dr. Destiny in the mouth. Three things that 
any dad would do. <laughs> uh, so Bookworm continues. Also, I think this is one of those situations where being a kid show makes the episodes more frightening because the writers had to work around censors. They had to imply certain awful things were happening instead of showing them. Mm. I think leaving those moments to the imagination makes them more unsettling. I agree entirely. Yes. Captain Alsis chimed in and said he was going to recommend the same episode. Great minds think alike. Yeah. Does anybody remember? I was I was um, babysitting once my my um, cousins nephews yeah. cousins. cousins yeah. And this like genie, Robin Williams comes up on the TV and he's like, "Great minds think alike." And then he he said something about Albert Einstein. And every time I say that or somebody else says that, I just think of the genie. I don't even like the genie. <laughs> I, I wasn't a big Disney person mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously. So uh, Zehanot10 chimes in to say Lex, Lex's speech to Amazo about having purpose in life is great. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about Amazo yeah, in the, remember, the last yeah. episode. Yeah, And Captain Alice has chimed in. Uh, to say the DCAU Lex is far and away the best iteration of Luther by a mile and my favourite take on Amazo too while the dialogue isn't as strong the implications are dialed up to 11 when Lex lectures Brainiac on purpose that was a scary scary day in the DC universe should we watch Smallville um we could do I mean it's got John Glover in it uh, and the voice Michael of the Riddler. Rosenbaum oh yeah and Michael Rosenbaum as well yes yeah as if I feel like I'm like obsessed, but I'm not. I just he's my favorite Flash, hmm. and obviously now my best friend. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and he talks about my my boyfriend. Yeah, should we tell him that we got married? I don't know. He might send us a gift. <laughs> no, thank <laughs> you. We don't right. accept gifts. <laughs> We've got too much shit as it is. No, send me your stuff, Michael Rosenbaum. I, should, I shouldn't swear. <laughs> Okay, so Captain Al says now with a comment of his own. If you're still looking for good Halloween material, I second the recommendation of Only a Dream from Justice League. It explores everyone's literal nightmares and Batman buys coffee. It's great. As for Scarecrow, I highly suggest Never Fear from the new Batman Adventures for its great twist on the fear toxin plot device. And Batman comes a hair's breadth away from crossing a line. A delightfully different approach to fright. So you remember that episode where mm -hmm. Batman loses fear and mm -hmm. he just brutalizes everybody because he's not afraid of killing them mm -hmm. uh, and he like chokes the life out of the scarecrow which i'm surprised they actually allowed to show on yeah. tv because strangulation but that is, was is later a... on though wasn't it yes but they still had rules about not yeah. doing uh, everyday kind of violent acts that children could replicate yeah but uh yeah still anyway uh, and if you want to branch out from the dcau you should try the long halloween if you haven't already it is fairly well done and has a good take on two-face but the darkest themes are gut-wrenching in a very realistic way it won't hurt to check a trigger warning list for anyone who may give it a watch i am that's actually going to be my halloween movie this year uh that is what i'm going to watch luke has watched it yeah of course um but i have not so that is my halloween movie this year your pal Troy Baker is the Joker in that as well. Mm -hmm. As for Captain Alsace's question, here's a fun question. Which DC hero or heroine would you like to have seen as a regular cast member in BTAS? Anyone from Justice League, The Signal, maybe Chief O'Hara, Saints Preserve Us. On the flip side, is there a villain who didn't appear in BTAS that you would have liked as a primary rogue? Question. The question? Yeah. Sorry, I thought... <laughs> I thought you were going to ask a question. No, <laughs> no question. I think um, I think he would have brought something to to Batman that would have been it would have added to it, mm -hmm. and I it agree. would have been nice. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Question's a good shout. Um, just for giggles, I'm going to say Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing was only visible in the background in one episode of Justice League Unlimited, and he was seen on a on the Justice League episode comfort and joy walking around in the background on the alien planet but I, I, my my pick is swamp thing can i be honest about swamp thing you don't think he's amazing no 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 that's fine i think it's because like i don't like the idea of a swamp mm -hmm. the only time that i like being i've never been in a swamp thankfully but the only time that i like being in a swamp is when i'm playing red dead redemption 2 mm -hmm. so in terms of villains that didn't appear in BTS that you'd have liked as a primary rogue um you know, to be funny, like you were with your last answer, I'm going to say Lobo. I wasn't being funny. I think Swamp Thing's good. <laughs> and Lobo was in Superman. I don't know if that counts. Well, outside of Lobo, 
Um, I mean, I think they did all of the best villains that were yeah. around at the time. I was, I was thinking that, like, they think in uh, BTS has the best um, villains. I think uh, Justice League and 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 the other shows they have they have, a, they have good villains, but I think the greatest villains came from from BTS. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I suppose somebody like the Wrath, who's like the anti-Batman, so his parents were criminals that were gunned down by the police, and he basically seeks revenge on the police. Mm -hmm. uh, that one might be interesting, but I don't know if he'd be a primary rogue. No. But I guess that's going to be my answer, the Wrath. Yeah. So, RDP16 Rules returns and hey! says... Hello again. And says, hey, Luke and Mary, thanks again so, for answering my questions. You're welcome. BTS is one of the shows that my mum would watch with me growing up. X-Men and Spider-Man also fit that category. A large part of that has to do with the solid writing that can appeal to older audiences. The writer's approach seemed to target all audiences, not just kids. That's right. why it was good at not talking down to its audience. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, definitely. And now for some hashtag totally shway questions. Hey. What are your thoughts on Bruce Tim? Funnily enough, we talked about him earlier in this episode, didn't we? No, Bruce Tim is is wonderful, great great artist, and I think that the show wouldn't be what it is without him. But I just wish that even if it's unintentional, which I'm I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt because I don't know him personally and I don't um I don't know the complete circumstances. I just wish he would respect the other writers and illustrators and everything and just be like hey this person is the person who did this i only like said something but they were the main people that did it i think he does do that when okay. people ask so for instance in the batman animated book he for his introduction he basically says that yeah okay me and paul dini get a lot of the credit but it wasn't just us and he okay. lists a whole bunch of people yeah. But for instance, he cites Ted Blackman as being just as important as him and Paul mm -hmm. Dini because Ted Blackman designed Gotham City. Yeah. And he left after Batman the Animated Series. And you can tell yes, because you can. in the new Batman adventures, the Gotham of, of that show is. We briefly spoke about this, didn't we? About how it. The the Gotham just stopped being a main, like a main character. Mm. Like it stopped being billed as like Batman, Robin gotham there was just you know mm -hmm. it wasn't there yeah. and it, it was because he left i think i think so too but yeah i think bruce tim is is great um so i've not read this book no it is something i would probably like to read one day but um i do think that as viewers of the show we shouldn't have to to think about these things what we should be thinking about is the amazing writers creators illustrators artists rather than just you know picking on bruce or or picking on, on anyone um i think we should just say hey bruce might not have mentioned this person he might have but hey this person was great so let's let's talk about the other people mm. yeah and that's what i'm trying to yeah do exactly well. so, okay we yeah. briefly spoke about this earlier but yeah so uh rdp 16 rules continued by saying so what are your thoughts on bruce tim not just as a writer but in general as i got older i remember reading the sin city comics after the movie came out and seeing a drawing tim contributed to the book at the time i was unaware of how much he liked drawing female characters oh, oh we've got his naughty but nice book I, haven't we uh, yes. something i really need to, to mention before we go on sorry mm. i love love the way that he um interprets the the the, the female body whether it's clothed or not <laughs> <laughs> um because it's very it's very much my sort of um it's it, it reminds me of like mid-century modern um with with an edge um in term in terms of his, his his artwork but i just think it's just so beautiful because he doesn't just draw the the average white lady mm -hmm. you know it's it's very it, it's it's women like he likes drawing women i mean and and other things but i just love that yeah so the naughty but nice book is his life model drawing book and it's mm -hmm. pretty much all women no it is all women actually now that i think yeah, about it yeah it is do we have two copies we've of... got a soft cover and a hard cover yeah i yes. thought so cuz yeah. you know i love having um, my favorite books in hardcover 
Um, so if I have that in hardcover and I love it, I'm going to have to get in softcover because I'm going to actually want to look at it. Yeah. I'm a collector. So to continue RDP 16 rules, his comment, uh, he states, then came his contributions to the movie adaptation of Killing Joke. Personally, I feel like he's a brilliant artist, but kind of a weird dude. Well, I don't know if I'd agree with that. He's an artist. I, I don't, in my, in my opinion, I don't, I don't, I don't think he's weary. So the next question is, um, just in time for Halloween, what famous horror movie icon do you think Batman should fight? He's already fought the Predators, Xenomorphs, Jack the Ripper, Vampires, Werewolves, Dracula, and creatures from the Cthulhu mythos. And that's not even diving into the Elseworld comics. Personally, I would like to see him solve the Death Note case and the mystery of the Candyman. Oh my, I've not seen Death Note. Um, that would be, that would be interesting, the Candyman. I like Candyman a lot. Um, it's one of those, um, it came out at the right time for me to, to like it a lot. Mm. But in, in terms of horror movie, oh my God, I'm just going to say it just to be funny. Go on then. Godzilla. <laughs> well, that's, it's funny you say that. They've just published the Justice League versus Godzilla versus Shut King the Kong front comic. door. Yeah, we haven't received our copy yet because we ordered the, um, <clears throat> the, the sound effect version. So when you open the cover, it plays a roar. Did you tell me about this? Yes, I did. I, guess I just, just completely forgot. forgot. I love, by the way, I don't know if you guys have noticed, <clears throat> but I, I like Godzilla a lot. <laughs> I like it. I'm going to start watching the um, the older original um, Japanese movies once I can find all of them in one place. Because I can find um, like several of them. But there, there are quite a few missing in between, and I'm the type of person that wants to watch something in like sequential order, even though it doesn't really matter if you watch Godzilla in sequential order or not. That's just how I am. But yeah, I want him to fight Godzilla, so I'm gonna have to change my mind. So tell him, tell me yours first. Creature from the Black Lagoon, because it's the only Universal Pictures uh, classic monster that I can think of. Oh, does it have to be Universal? No, no, that's oh, just what okay. I was thinking. I like the old Universal uh, monsters, but he's fought the Invisible Man, he's fought Dracula, he's fought Frankenstein, he's fought werewolves. So, Creature from the Black Lagoon, even though that is kind of close to Killer Croc. the person we shall not name on this podcast, the dog, he's worked with him, but he's not fought him, has he? Scooby-Doo. Ah, uh, that's not Universal. <laughs> no, Scooby-Doo can... Who, is, who should he fight? <laughs> Well, you, said, oh, you said Godzilla. Yeah. So some of my favorite horror movies are like Rosemary's Baby, Candyman, and you've already said Candyman. And, um... <laughs> he should fight the car, Christine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it. How about It? That would be a good one. We all float down here, Brucey. Oh, God. <laughs> that would be so messed up. That wouldn't be a kid's... That wouldn't be a kid's... Batman is not afraid of clowns, though, no. so... He'd, or spiders I'm, so i'm not afraid of clowns <laughs> i'm not going to comment on spiders i won't kill them but i don't want to live with them okay so next we have r083rt amanda waller is an anti-villain and i love her for it okay you're entitled to your opinion <laughs> well you like amanda waller as well <laughs> I, know, I was making a joke yeah i like amanda waller but she is one of the worst characters. And when I say worst characters, I'm not talking about written. She's written beautifully. But I'm talking about is in... She did one of the worst things a, 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 a character could ever do. And again, we, we, we spoke about this in another episode. Mm -hmm. So I won't go on about it. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on to the last comment. And this has been a bit of a bumper episode, actually. Been trying to do shorter ones recently, but we just keep getting longer. Meh. <laughs> All right, so last comment. Video Crow's Nest says, For villains, listening to the conversation, it made me think. It does depend on what the aim for them is, as well as what story they feature in. Batman villains do benefit from sympathetic backstories in general, though not all of them, the Sewer King, for example, wouldn't be any less despicable if he had some sob story to tell. True. Darkseid, on the other hand, is not a Batman villain and is more a Justice League Superman villain. So any backstory would be pretty insignificant when the main focus is on how much of a threat he is and his sheer ruthless malice. Kind of one of those cases of 
Everyone being morally grey does not remove the existence of sheer malicious evil, as those sorts of individuals do also exist, albeit quite rare. Caution needing to thus be applied with such thought. We know they are being pretty much indisputably evil and simply don't care. Not everyone strives to be the hero of their own stories, or anything for that matter, and are just sheer malice unleashed. You should write a book. <laughs> For yeah. Simon and Scholster. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And thanks to everyone for leaving the comments and the questions. Really appreciate it. Yeah. I love hearing from you guys. Um, I also, I love you know, talking about talking about these shows and everything. And sometimes it don't make sense, but hey-ho. Hmm. It's, it's nice to have people to you know reciprocate okay with all the questions out of the way the last thing we need to do is talk about what's coming up next time yeah. so i told you what's coming up mary didn't i but yeah. I, i'll go through it again if you I'll, like i'll talk about it okay so we unfortunately lost someone near and dear to us last year and that person was kevin conroy and we are going to kind of do an episode to memorialize him yeah because i this is through sheer chance um then the drop date for the next episode is actually the one year anniversary of his death yeah so we're gonna take some time to just share our recollections from the one time we met him and oh, what a great yeah, yeah it was a great day but we'll talk more about that and we'll yeah. talk about his 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 legacy and and I, I don't want to just limit his um, this this episode that we're doing to just the DCAU. No. So this is, you know, I can make exceptions to my podcast if I want to. <laughs> but I, I do want to talk about some of the other yeah. stuff that he did because he was a very interesting uh, person. But also did some very important things. And important because he was genuine and he was uh, a grateful person. And he also helped people yeah and and i think learning from that man is one of the best things anybody could ever do and we'll talk about that more in um our next episode and um please share if you guys have any favorite like kevin stories or uh, favorite you know batman memories that really like touched you um, in the best way possible. And if you met him as well, oh, if you've yeah. got any recollections from that, please do share and we'll read them out. Yeah. Um, I don't want this to be like a, a sob, no. sob story episode. It's more, I'm tr I'm hoping that we kind of hit the tone of more of a celebration yeah. rather than a commiseration. Um, we should all be thankful that we were alive at the same time as him and we got to experience him during our lifetime. Yeah. Because a lot of times you hear about these people that are that are like Kevin, and you're like, "Damn, I wish that that type of soul or that type of person was was in our lifetime." And just like you said, we we're very grateful and appreciative. And again, we'll talk more about it um, the next time. But I will always and forever say this about that man: lovely, <laughs> just overall a lovely man that when i met him i have never in my life had someone just put their arms out to me like that and it meant something and i'll never forget it unless i get alzheimer's but <laughs> no you even even when you don't yeah. know who i am you'll be like oh where's kevin <laughs> yeah um yeah all that and more <laughs> <laughs> next time on totally shway <laughs> Thank you.